Hello, so today I'm gonna to be showing you how to set up multi-touch data in Touch Designer. So I've got this iPhone over here that can send its multi-touch data. Uh, this would also work on an iPad. And then I've got this Wacom tablet that can send 10 point multi-touch data. So I'm gonna show you how to set it up with both of these devices. I've been using this technique a lot recently to control my visuals. So if you wanna see that in action, you can check out Prismatic Visuals on Instagram. So first I wanna tell you the story of how I got to this point. Feel free to skip ahead if you want. But uh, last summer I had this idea of using multi-touch to control visuals. And it seemed really exciting to me because you can be really accurate with the timing. You can create these sort of expressive movements. And one of my main focuses as an artist is trying to develop expressive forms of input to control visuals in real time. So this seemed like a really good fit. So I sort of went on a quest to figure out the best multi-touch input to use in Touch Designer. Uh, I started with the iPhone, which seems like kind of an obvious choice because it has all this built-in quality multi-touch. I started with this application, Zigsim Pro, which you may have heard of. It's a pretty popular application for sending data over OSC from the iPhone. But when I tried it for multi-touch, it was super laggy. It would only send, you know, like 15 frames per second or something of touch events. I did some more digging and eventually I found this app, TC Data, which is a really awesome app that I think more people should know about. It lets you send multi-touch data over OSC as well as a bunch of other sensor data, different device input data. So if you're looking to send data from the iPhone, I think it's a fantastic choice. And the FPS of the multi-touch data is pretty quick, which makes it very usable. So this is what I ended up using for iPad and iPhone, and I'll go more into about how to set that up later. I also tried out this device, LightPad Block Studio Edition. I saw that it can actually have pressure sensitivity with multi-touch, which seemed like it might be sort of holy grail. But when I actually tried it, the API does not seem precise enough for this use case. When you have multiple touches going in quick succession, it will kind of miss touch events and it won't properly update. So fingers will get stuck on screen, if that makes sense. So I think it's unfortunately not a great option for this. Another option that I've thought about but haven't had a chance to test would be using a multi-touch monitor for Windows, like the Surface Pro, and just using the multi-touch API that's built into Windows machines. So if you have a multi-touch monitor and want to try that out and see how it works, please let me know. I'd be really curious. So finally, I kind of stumbled upon this fact that the Wacom tablet has really good multi-touch. It was sort of an interesting process of how I got there. So earlier last year, I was doing a lot with live drawing with the Wacom tablet. You can see here I'm using the pen to create these sort of graffiti-like effects. And this was great, but there was a big limitation. Um, I was using a Max interface to control the Touch Designer visuals, but the problem is Touch Designer can only pick up the tablet data when the window has focus. So if you see when, when Touch Designer has focus here, I switch over, now the pen doesn't work. So I had this idea that maybe if I developed my own application that would access the Wacom data, I could send it out over OSC and it would not have this limitation of needing to be in focus. So I was digging through the Wacom developer resources and I found an example of how to access the pen data. Unfortunately, it did not fix the issue though. It seems like that limitation is baked into the Wacom API that you can't access the pen data unless the window has focus. So that was a bit of a, a failed attempt, but when I was looking through these examples, I discovered that it has this amazing multi-touch API that you can get 10 fingers simultaneously with really low latency. So that was a really exciting moment for me because it was a, a totally separate pursuit that ended up solving this other pursuit. Maybe that was more information than you needed, but kind of an interesting story. So I ended up developing the software called Tablet 2 OSC that can access both multi-touch data and pen data and send that information over OSC to whatever application you want to use and I'll talk about that more later in the video. Now I want to show you how you can get set up with TC Data to send multi-touch data from your iPhone or iPad. First up, you're going to have to buy this app. It is $20. I think it's worth it, but keep that in mind. Once you have the app, you can download my project file. There's going to be a link in the description for that. You'll need to get it onto your phone somehow. You can email it to yourself. You can save it to Google Drive, OneDrive, whatever. I'm going to show an example using this email I sent myself. So you can open up the file, click the share button, scroll over and find TC data, and then it should open in the app and you can start using it. Once you have the patch, you can configure it. So double tap in the bottom right to open the menu, click edit. 
Here you can see all the OSC messages that I've created for basic multi-touch. You could also click this plus button and add new OSC messages to send. There's a lot of touch data. You can calculate distance to the center of multiple touches, which is pretty cool. You can also get Apple Pencil data, gyroscope data, and more. So the next step is to configure your OSC settings. If you click here in the top right and click OSC setup, this is where you can set your target IP address and port that needs to match what you're expecting on your computer. I'm gonna show you how you can find your local IP address in Windows, which you'll need for this. So go to settings, you can go down to network and internet, click Wi-Fi, and then click the network that you're connected to, scroll down, and you'll see this IPv4 address. That's the address that you'll want to copy into TC data. Another way you can find it more quickly is through the command prompt. So if you do Windows R, type in CMD, that'll open command prompt, and then you can do IP config, and it'll pop up right there, IPv4 address. So the main limitation you're gonna have when using the iPhone or iPad with TC data is that it's very dependent on your Wi-Fi network. So if you're on a slow network, it's gonna be really choppy. And even on decent networks, it can get a little choppy. This might be improved using an ethernet cable. I haven't tried that yet, but that's something you could try if you run into that. But ultimately that's why I decided to stick with the Wacom tablet, which plugs in via USB and has really low latency data and doesn't depend on any network, which can be tough to find sometimes. Now that we've set up TC data properly, we can start to work with this data in Touch Designer. Got a blank slate here. I'm gonna create an OSC in DAT to see what we're working with here. And I set my TC data port to be 10,000. Now you should see all this data coming in. And what you might notice here is that it has two arguments. The first argument is the value, and the second argument is the finger index which is a little bit tricky to work with because if you just create an OSC in CHOP, that's not gonna work. If we set this to 10,000, it's not gonna get the proper data because Touch Designer can't handle two arguments simultaneously with a CHOP. So we need to kind of reformat this data to work properly with the OSC in CHOP. The plan here is to use this callback to reformat the message and then send it back out over OSC and receive it on a different port. I'm gonna add an OSC out dat here that we can use to send messages. And I'm gonna open up this callbacks dat. And in this dat, we can start by accessing the value and the finger index. So the value is going to be the first argument, as we saw. The finger index is going to be the second argument, but I'm going to convert this to an int and stir. Now I'm gonna create a new address to send this value out to, which is gonna be address, plus a slash, plus the finger index. So now I'm gonna send this value out over the new address using that OSC out dat. So we can say op of OSC out one dot send OSC. This is a Python method of that dat. And we can say new address and put value within an array, which is what this is expecting. So this OSC out is sending to 7,000. I'm going to set this OSC in chop to be 7,000. Now you can see we've reformatted the addresses, so the finger index is part of the address, which is going to make this a lot easier to work with. So our goal is to use this data for an instancing setup, and I'll explain the instancing later. What we're looking for here is a few channels, X position, Y position, scale, and color. That's what we're trying to create from this, four channels that we can use in our instancing setup. So to start, I'm gonna work a bit with scale. I'm going to select the is down channels here. So star is down star. What I wanna do here is use a trigger chop, which will add sort of attack, decay, sustain, release to those touch values, which will make the scale a little bit nicer to work with, if that makes sense. So I'm gonna set the attack to zero. Let's set the decay to 0.1. Sustain level, we can do like 0.7, release 0.25. And that creates a nice little envelope when we touch. Um, and this can be whatever you want. You can configure this trigger. So now I'm gonna rename this to be TC data slash trigger slash star. And that star is gonna use the value of this first star. So now we still have those indices. So now I'm going to merge this back into the original signal. So we've got the trigger as a new set of channels. And what we wanna do here is shuffle these so that instead of having a separate channel for each of these finger indices, 
we want to combine all of each data type. So all of the X positions, we want to be in one channel. All of the Y positions, we want to be in one channel. And the way we can do that is by using sequence channels by name. So now you'll see we have just one channel for each type of data, which is exactly what we want for an instancing setup. And one little thing to note here, you'll notice that these indices are kind of scrolling by, and that's gonna be bad news later on because it will cause Touch Designer to kind of hiccup. And I found a workaround. Uh, I don't know why this works, but it does. If you add a record chop and set the record output to segment and set the record segment and to zero, you'll notice that these values are no longer scrolling. This is totally static, which is gonna work much better when we start to use this data. So we've got these channels. I'm going to rename them. And I actually like to rename with a select chop because it's a little bit safer. I'll explain why. So I am going to select X, Y, size, trigger, X down, and Y down. And let's rename them to be a little nicer. X, Y, size, trigger, X down, Y down. So why am I doing it like this instead of a rename chop? The reason is that when you use a select chop, it will select only the data you want and it will give you the order that you put these channel names. When you're working with something like TC data, the input might change over time. If I were to add a new data stream here, there might be a new channel in the shuffle chop. The order of them might change depending on the order of the events coming from the app. And if I just do a rename chop that's expecting the same order and channels, that could break over time. So using the select chop is just a little bit safer. All right, so now that we have these nice channels, I'm just going to kind of finalize these target channels that we're working with, X position, Y position, scale, and color. So I'm gonna create a merge chop, because I know I'm gonna need that. We're gonna connect this select here. Uh, the X and Y positions are already done. Those are normalized between zero and one, which is the output that we want. So next we can work with size. I'm going to select size from here. And I'm also going to select the trigger. And what I wanna do is basically use these two together. The size is gonna be the, the touch size, which depends on how your finger is positioned. And the trigger is um, using that envelope based on whether the touch is down. So I wanna combine these to create the final scale. So I'm gonna plug these both in here. And what we wanna do here is combine these two chops by multiplying them together. And then I'm going to rename this to be scale. And connect this into our merge as a new channel. So one thing here, this size, this touch size parameter can go from zero to one, which is gonna make a big difference in the output. So we might wanna reduce the impact of that a bit. So I'm going to collapse these into a new base. We'll call this TC data. And I'm gonna create a new custom parameter here called min size. And maybe 0.5 is a decent default. So what I wanna do is before we multiply these two together, I'm going to add a math here and rearrange this. Instead of going from zero to one, I want to go from min size to one. Um, let's just bind that. So now the effect of this can be lessened. If I want the min size to be one, the touch size isn't going to make any effect. It's just gonna be the trigger value. You know, I can bring it down to 0.5 so that it, it does have some effect. So the next step is creating the color values, right? So for this, I'm gonna use the down position. So I'm gonna do select here, X down, Y down. And those are the values when you first touch the screen where that position is. The goal here is to say like, I want each touch to maintain the same color throughout its life. I just think it could look kind of nice, right? Maintain some consistency. I'm going to use these values to generatively create colors. And the way we can do that 
is with a noise chop. I'm going to set the channels to be RGB. And this first input says sampling points. So what this is doing is using these XY coordinates as sampling points of the noise. So the, the noise values will depend on these input values. So we can see what these colors are gonna look like using a chop two. I'm gonna create a null here and pass that in here. So we'll do RGB data format and it's really dark. So we might need to change the offset here to be, yeah, maybe 0.5. And some of them are still pretty dark. I'm gonna use nearest pixel here so we can see each color. And there's a little trick to help those become brighter, which is, I'm gonna add a math here and find the maximum channel value. Combine channels, maximum. And I'm gonna use an expression here to do one over the maximum. And then I'm gonna use a math. Plug this in here, plug this in here, and multiply these together. Combine chops, multiply. Now if I plug this in here, these are all gonna be brighter. And basically what this is doing is making sure that at least one channel within the color is one. So we're taking the maximum channel, we're taking one over that value, which is what you need to multiply it by to make it equal one. And then we're multiplying all of the channels by that. So we're scaling up the color so that at least one channel is going to be one. So now you can see we've got these kind of nice bright generative colors whenever I make a new touch. Realizing these channel names got a little messed up, so we just need to change the order there. So now we have these RGB channels, and we can add that into our merge chop. Now we're looking pretty good. We've got our colors, we've got our scale, we've got our X and Y. Later on, I will explain how you can use this data for the instancing setup. So if you just want to use iPhone or iPad and you don't care about Wacom, feel free to skip ahead to that section. Now I'm going to talk about setting up multi-touch with the Wacom tablet. So step one, of course, is to buy a Wacom tablet. I have the Intuos Pro Medium, and it's important to make sure that you have a tablet which has multi-touch capabilities. Looks like this is a list of options here. Once you have a tablet, you need to download the right driver at this website, and you should now have this application Wacom Center. I like to configure this a little bit to work better with controlling real-time visuals. So something I've done is in the touch and gesture settings, reduced pointer speed and scrolling speed, and turned off all of these gestures. I don't really want it to control my computer. I just want the multi-touch data. So I'm basically minimizing its effect on my computer. And just for reference, I've done the same thing with the, the pen. I've disabled all of these. The next step, once you've configured your tablet, is to get this software I developed called Tablet to OSC. It's available on Gumroad, and I'll put a link in the description for that. So this software can access both multi-touch data and pen data. I'm asking for a minimum of 15. Uh, any support there is much appreciated. Depending on how much support it gets, I've got these development goals that I might continue to work on, like creating a Mac version, creating a custom C++ chop to access the data directly in Touch Designer, and also access other data from the tablet, like these Express keys. Once you've purchased the app and run the installer, you should have this new application called Tablet 2 OSC. It's a pretty simple application. Um, if you start to move, if you have a touch compatible tablet and touch is enabled, you should see these circles being drawn for each point that it detects touch. The other features to note are that you can configure the output address and output port for OSC. So you can send this to a different machine if you want. You can also configure the port. And that's about it. You can hit escape to clear. This window doesn't need to be focused to send the data, which is really nice. So you can actually minimize it and continue to work with it and send the data over OSC. So now I'm gonna show you how to bring this Wacom to OSC data into Touch Designer. It's gonna be a pretty similar process to TC Data. So I'm just going to copy this base, call it Wacom, and we'll just edit this. So we don't need to do this whole reformatting process. I'm gonna just delete these and change the OSC import to be 8000 which is the default output port for tablet to OSC. So now if I reset these channels, you should see all the multi-touch data coming in. So we've already got this trigger set up. We need to change this rename to have the proper format here. Touch is down star, and we'll change that to touch trigger star. 
So now we've got that all merged in. We've got the record and shuffle set up. Now we need to change this select setup. So I'm going to delete all those. We'll do touch X, touch Y, um, trigger X down and Y down. So we don't have a size channel here because there's no touch size detection on Wacom. There actually is, but it's really bad. It doesn't work well for whatever reason. So now we've got these samples and we can start to do the same process of creating color values and scale values. The color values, I don't need to change. That's already working perfectly. The scale values, we're gonna take a look at. Instead of having this touch size to work with, what I want to do is use a similar sort of setup with this down position to generatively create a size for each touch when it first touches the pad and then use that throughout its life. I'm going to create a noise here and we're gonna do the same thing of plugging in this X down, Y down into that first input to create these generative scale values. We can call this scale. Next, I'm going to normalize those values because they're gonna be all over the place. We can use that using a limit and checking normalize. Now, once we have this normalized, we can plug this into the math to rearrange it. In this case, it's gonna be negative one to one. That's what normalize does in the limit chop. And we still have this min size parameter, which is great. Now, when we multiply these together, you should see that the, the trigger is happening, but there's also each touch has its own individual scale on top of that. There are a lot of different ways you can generate different scale values. It doesn't have to be X down and Y down. You can also just use X and Y position, which is kind of fun. It'll change scale as you move your fingers. You could also use vertical position and distance from the center. There's a lot you could do. The same goes with colors. You could really do all sorts of different approaches to generate colors. So just as we had before with TC data, we've got some nice channels to work with. X, Y, scale, RGB, and we're ready for instancing. So now we've got these two controller sources to work with. I'm gonna use a join chop to combine the channels from each of those, and we want to match by channel name. I'm gonna create a null here, and this is what we're going to use for instancing. So let's get our instancing setup going. I want to use a circle sop for this sort of basic example. We're going to create a geo from that, and then we need a light and a camera. And then finally, a render. Set that to be 1920, 1080. And I'm going to create a constant matte to make it a pure color here. So now we have this basic rendering set up. The next step is to enable instancing. So we go to this first instance, turn on instancing, reference this null instancing chop, and now we can start to add in these parameters. So X, Y, you can see they're gonna move a little bit. Uh, we'll add our scale parameter here, scale, scale, scale. Now you can see they come in and out as we touch. And we're also gonna add our color here, R, G, and B. Now we have our generative colors that are determined based on the down position. The circle is way too big, so I'm gonna set the radius to be 0.1 by 0.1, and that should look a little bit better. Now I'm going to create a new pane so that we can work with this a little bit more easily. Create a null, turn on display, and use Alt 4 to set that to be a top viewer. You'll notice a problem here, which is that all the touches are in the top right corner because the values are normalized between zero and one. So we need to kind of rescale these values to work properly with this geometry setup. So I'm going to add a null here and right click collapse selected, which will create a new base to work with, call this prep channels. And we can delete this null and then create a merge chop. Basically, what we want to do here is select the different channels we're working with, rescale them using a math chop, and then merge them back in. And I'm gonna use keep last because we want to replace the original channels with the following chops. So let's create a select chop here. For now, I'm just gonna select nothing and create a math chop here to rearrange it. And we'll connect that to the merge. And then we can copy paste this a few times, X, Y, and scale. So let's start with X. 
we can do channel name X and we want to rearrange this so that it um, spreads out from the center. So we can do negative one to one. And now it'll go around the center. But it would be kind of nice if we could configure the, the amplitude of how far out it spreads from the center. So let's create a custom parameter here. We'll create a float two and call it position scale. And we'll use this first position scale to determine this range. And I want it to be negative position scale to positive. So if I set this to be two, it's now gonna go from negative two to positive two, which will fill the whole screen. What we wanna do now is set up the same thing with the Y position. So I'm gonna select Y here. We'll go to the math and do the same sort of mapping. We'll set that to be negative position scale two. And maybe we can make that 1.5 or something, um, however you want it to be. That actually needs to be connected in here. We weren't seeing it there. There we go. Okay, and then we can do scale here. Scale, this one we're just gonna multiply so we can scale up. Let's create another custom parameter here and call it scale. And maybe the, the max there could be 10 or something. So we have a nice slider to work with. Um, drag the scale into multiply. Now we can scale these up as we see fit. The last thing that I wanna add here is that I think it's kind of nice if the bigger circles are in front of the smaller circles. So I'm going to create a new scale selection and we're gonna rename this to be Z. And the uh, let's get rid of this multiply. Just one. Instead of zero to one, we wanna do like zero to point one, something count small. It actually doesn't really matter much. Um, and then if we plug this in here and we go back to our instancing setup, we can use that Z position to translate Z. And now the bigger the dot, the closer it is to the camera and it will be shown in front of the other ones. That's kind of personal preference. If you want it to be behind the other ones, that could also be kind of nice so that like you always see the smaller one on top, that's up to you. And that is the main instancing setup. We've got this thing working with both the iPhone and the Wacom tablet. And I just wanna make this look a little bit cooler. So I'm gonna create a little feedback system. We'll insert a null here in case you wanna add anything to the source and create a feedback top. Plug that null in here and let's create a composite top. Plug that in here. And I tend to just use under in these cases for really simple feedback and plug that in and drag that into the feedback. So now we've got this infinitely building drawing. Something we might wanna do here is add a level and decrease the alphabet over time, maybe like 0.94 or something, so it'll fade out. Let's add a little black background. Um, you can do that really quickly using RGB key, it's a little hack. I'm gonna add a blur here to make it kind of fade out. Let's increase that to like, yeah, that looks a little better. And something that I think looks kind of cool is increasing the contrast in the feedback loop. Contrast is basically an S-curve on the channel values, so it pushes every value to either zero or one. So over time, that's gonna make it, each channel of the color is gonna be zero or one. So you get sort of a movement towards these primary colors of red, yellow, green, blue, cyan, magenta. So that's about as far as I'm gonna go in this video. Of course, there's lots more you could do with this. You could improve the feedback setup, you could add displacement feedback, edge feedback, whatever you want. You could also improve the instancing setup, maybe add different geometry, maybe play with the other instancing parameters. You could also, if you want to get a little bit more advanced, pass this into a GLSL top as a texture array, and then access this data within a shader and do stuff like ray marching or creating 2D patterns and such. There's a lot you can do, but I hope that this is a decent jumping off point for your own explorations. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out my Gumroad. I'm gonna post project files, which will include the touch designer file, as well as the TC data patch. So I'll link to that in the description. And you can also find this tablet to OSC app if you want to use a Wacom tablet. This is the first time I've posted on Gumroad, so I'm 
curious to see how it goes. Definitely appreciate any support there. That will encourage me to make more videos like this. I've got a lot of ideas for tutorials. It can just be hard to find the time to make them. Maybe someday I'll make a Patreon if there's interest in that. So anyways, thanks for watching.